live from Washington and Connecticut. It's the Unqualified Film Bros podcast. Okay, so we're talking about Saturday night tonight. George and Max here for you. Ben's taking the week off. We hope you feel better, Ben. He did give a ringing endorsement of this movie in our group chat. Just want to get his thoughts out of the way first, because that's usually how we start these episodes is Ben gives his thoughts first. Um, but it's just the two of us tonight. We're going to have a little conversation. might be one of our shorter episodes, um, but uh, we are inviting you along for the ride, just as Lauren Michaels did 49 and a half years ago, or actually exactly about 49 years ago last week, um, when he launched NBC's Saturday Night. So, that being said, Max, Saturday Night, what do you think? But overall, it was pretty good. Um, you know, I think the last 15, 20 minutes when the tension really sort of came to a head and came to a boil and you you know where it's going to end up. You know, you know, like they hadn't said it all the movie. Um, you knew it was going to end with or, you know, somewhere at that point it was going to end with live from New York. It's Saturday night. You knew it had to come. The payoff was great. Um, but you know, you really felt, I really felt like it kind of finally hit its stride in the last 20 minutes and it made, it was so well done. Like you could feel the tension, you could really feel everything culminating, not only in sort of the frantic nature of trying to get this show that starts in three minutes up and running, but sort of the teamwork and the camaraderie, you kind of, you get that. Finally, it finally falls into place, just like the last brick did when they built the um, built the stage. Um, <clears throat> like, and you know, I I liked it. It was it was a so it was solid and it was fun. Um, I do think it was a little bit slow for most of the movie, but you know, I think that was part of it. <laughs> it was almost in real time, an hour and fifty minute movie. Like it was almost minute for minute, um, going from ten thirty or. 10 o'clock to 11 30 so kind of it, it makes sense that it would be but they kept it the the dialogue was snappy the the jokes hit um it was fun it's a good movie yeah um i i to the surprise of absolutely no one i loved it um you know late night comedy is my jam it's it's what i want to do next with my life if i'm not making movies um and this movie absolutely hits. Uh, like you said, it's it's sort of like a ticking time bomb almost with the uh, tension building over essentially a real-time fictionalization, dramatization of uh, what really happened that night at 30 Rock. Um, obviously, they had to take some liberties to, to make a, a story happen. Um, but just seeing the way, like you said, it all comes together in the third act I don't know. There's something about movies about TV and film production that just hit me so like at my core that this is, this is awesome. This is what I want to do with my life. This is what I want to see. Uh, this, this is what I want every experience I ever have to be like. Uh, and, and so it was really personal for me almost to, experience you know, the creation of the greatest sketch show in the history of tv comedy mm -hmm. uh and even though there were like i said some creative liberties taken and and some uh narrative elements a little bit more hollywood than maybe happened in 1975 we still get a very real sense of tension we still get a really real sense of the uh, comedic strengths of literally everyone involved um and and it, it was just a really really fun watch and in the last 20 minutes completely blew me out of the water yeah really great stuff there and you know even the like the name drops that happened throughout the uh movie oh billy crystal or al franken or obviously the big ones with John Belushi and, you know, uh, George Carlin, like all those big players, heavy hitters um, in comedy that hadn't quite made it, some of them at that point. Um, but 
we now know them, their household names, Chevy Chase. How did I forget Chevy Chase? Right. Yeah. He's, he's front and center with, with that. I, I mean, to your point about all the name drops and the not even cameos, cause they're not the real no. people, obviously. Um, but Billy Crystal, his, his mm -hmm. character being in three or four scenes throughout the movie, still very memorable. One, because obviously we all know and love Billy Crystal, but two, the actor who's playing him gives a phenomenal performance and it feels really real. Uh, Al Franken, I don't even know if he's named, but we recognize him because of the hair and the glasses. He is named. That's is? actually how I recognize it. That's how, because I, I heard it and then oh, he I... was listed at another point. Um, like Al... I think it's some nickname, but I forget what it was, like Tubby or something. Franken, I think is what it was. Yeah, I yeah. I must have missed that, but but still to be able to, oh, a, to pick him a out. Blink, there's a blink and you miss it. Yeah. yeah. Um <clears throat> and then obviously the not right the not ready for primetime players as as they were known. Uh mm -hmm. Chevy and and Gilda and Belushi and Danny Aykroyd. Uh yeah. Lorraine Newman, Jane Curtin. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm forgetting somebody. Um, but probably because I mean, think of how because... it's, been, it's been 50 years of making household names out of up and coming comedians, right? Yeah, and and this movie, I think where it draws a lot of its strengths. And I watched a great interview with uh, Rachel Senat and um, Dylan O'Brien. Mm -hmm. And I think Gabriel LaBelle was in there too, but they were talking about how in this film and, and Reitman's talked about it a lot too. Uh, they weren't going for, and SNL has, you know, one of the things it's best known for is producing these comedy impressionists. And, you know, I, I dabble with celebrity impressions on TikTok, and I, I have my fun with that once every week or once every other week, but these are legit comedic talents who do impressions on Saturday Night Live every week, which is a lot of comedians' dreams. Yeah. Uh, and these actors playing Chevy Chase, Gilda Radner, Billy Crystal, Lorne Michaels, they're not doing impressions of these figures. They are playing them as film characters. And I think that this film is really, really made stronger because we're not seeing somebody doing... Belushi. We're not seeing somebody doing Lorraine Newman. We're seeing actors in roles as characters. Playing them as characters rather than historical figures. It's not a biopic. And it's not a parody. So I, I, I think I, I think that's one of the things that I enjoyed most about it was that we were seeing historic historical figures in the sense of late night TV comedy not as caricatures. And yeah, I think that's but... that's something that it really risked falling into mm -hmm. with it being a Saturday Night Live origin story movie, for lack of a better phrase. And I, I think it absolutely nailed on pretty much every single performance. But again, I, I think it's it's the right choice too, because think of what the subject matter is. It's Saturday Night Live. And when you're getting in a, a celebrity impersonation, on Saturday Night Live, you're not getting a biopic worthy performance of Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton or Kamala Harris, right? You're getting I don't know. I would trust Kate McKinnon to do Hillary Clinton in a biopic. You're, but you're getting true, fair. But you're getting you're getting a character version. And so, you know, when you're making a film about Saturday Night Live, when you want to make it funny and you want to tell a story you are going to be doing it based off of the characters that you see on screen, which are the characters that are portrayed by Chevy Chase, right? Chevy Chase isn't playing Chevy Chase on Saturday Night Live. He's playing a funny version of, right? Or he's playing a different character. And so I think that's why it works. And because it's it, if they had tried to do too much biographical information about any of these people, one, and way overstuffed, and it'd be probably north of the three hour mark, just like their original um, script for the show was. 
and then you just lose a lot of the intrigue. Like I don't, I, you know, I don't go. I'm not going to see Saturday Saturday night to get biographical information on these people. I want to see how they are interacting with each other, and how they're interacting with each other is best done through characters. Yeah, especially, like, we could have seen, th this movie could have been Lorne pitching the show to NBC, then recruiting all of these talents, then rehearsals and seeing some of the conflicts begin, and then finding the host in George Carlin, and musical guests, and then... Jim Henson and the Muppets and Billy Crystal doing his stand-up and seeing how this three-hour monstrosity was built. But I think Reitman really respects his audience by saying, you know that story. You Yeah. know that this show was going to come to be in 1975. So why don't we pick up 90 minutes before the broadcast and just show how fucking crazy it was in Studio 8H in across 30 Rock Yeah. that night. And the movie just soars from there. We get the premise. We are with you from square one when we see Finn Wolfhard out on that street at the beginning of the movie saying, free comedy show, free comedy show tonight. Free tickets. Uh, free tickets. Fuck's sake, or whatever he does. That's one of the best parts of the trailer. Um, And and I, I I applaud the creative decision by Jason Reitman to go into this movie from that moment. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it, it was like an hour 45, hour 50, anyway, playing almost real time. Yeah. Nobody's going to see Saturday night, like you said, if it's three hours long and we're getting... All of the exposition, all of the backstory. Who is Lorne Michaels? Well, let's flash back to his Yeah, childhood. we don't we don't care. Like, I'm sorry, we just don't. Okay, <laughs> we It care, made the world but we laugh. don't need to see it. Yeah, like we don't need to see that right now. This is not the movie to do that with. Right. And um, they didn't do they didn't delve into any of it, and I I really appreciated that. No, th this movie treats its audience with as much respect as they treat Saturday Night Live for the last, as they have treated Saturday Night Live. For the last 49 years. And, you know, just going back to the, the nature of these performances in the cast, I, I think that's all elevated by the fact that we're focusing on one night, Mm -hmm. right? We can get the, the sense of the relationships between each member of the cast. We can get the sense of, Lauren's relationship with the higher ups at NBC, Willem Dafoe, great performance here. Uh, Yeah. Mm -hmm. we can get the sense of his relationship with Rachel Senat's character. Uh, we don't need to see their whole background. We get a couple of mentions in conversation about, oh, well, we grew up together, and I always thought that he was going to sort of move on and do his own thing, but then he sort of latched on, and then we got married because that's what you do. And now... I think the line was like, uh, I'm your wife, but we're not married or we're married, but I'm not your wife. Yeah, something like that. Um, which is a great line of dialogue. Because Really, it really tells you well everything written. you need to know about them without Exactly. saying anything else. It doesn't show, it doesn't spend 15 minutes looking back at what was the marriage like and then Yeah. flashing back to the same moment where Oh well, I learned something from that flashback that will I that I will then apply to how I handle this situation and everything else for the rest of the night. And so keeping the energy up, keeping the pacing up, keeping and you're right that there there were some slower moments throughout the pacing dipped a couple of times, mostly in the second act. But we we get that energy and we get that tension, and we really don't lose it throughout the entire film. Like your heart will hit or patter until, you know, we hit the Wolverine sketch and Belushi wanders down those stairs carrying the bag and O'Donohue does the dialect coach and 
we're on our way. And by the way, brilliant creative choice to end the movie with that scene. Obviously, you figured it was going there. We weren't going to actually see the first episode of Saturday Night. Of course. In this movie, we were only going to see maybe the first sketch. And of course, with a first sketch as iconic as that one, like, yeah, that's just that's not even an Easter egg. It's just a little wink to yeah. even casual viewers of the show. And clutch that it was only about a two and a half, three minute sketch. Some mm -hmm. of SNL's sketches these days can stretch to like five or six minutes. Their cold opens can be even longer. Um, but just the, the way that everything comes together in the third act of this film was so gratifying and satisfying from a viewing perspective where despite everything going wrong all night, we know as an audience that the show went up that night. So we knew it was all going to work out. And then the way that that is presented is really, really cathartic to see it all work out. Lauren standing there, the house is packed, Belushi and O'Donohue do the sketch. And then Chevy walks out and says the line. Yeah, it was, it was perfect. Even, even before then, Willem Dafoe, when there's the moment where obviously, you know, he's going to say go live, but there's that pause where it's like, okay, this is it. And then you need to give that kind of a line, something theatrical. And he delivered on that, right? We go in live and like points like, like that's such a great yeah. moment. And that sets up the rest of, I mean, the final like six minutes. <laughs> yeah. And, and the whole, I mean, there's so many moving pieces in this story between like Andrew Barth Feldman getting high for the first time and Finn Wolfhard, who we only see at the beginning and the end of the movie as a page, by the way, brand name to have as a bit part it is just an NBC page. Yeah. Um, we've got the, the relationship between, uh, between every single one of the cast members. We've got Belushi fighting with Chevy. We've got the bricklayers, and, and the, all the union guys, the Lauren's search for a lighting designer. Lauren and uh, Lauren trying to get the uh, the NBC execs all on the same page about this show. J.K. Simmons wandering in as this TV comedy legend and being a pervert. Yeah. Uh, there are so many moving pieces that... The, the the filmmaker in me wants to imagine what this movie could have been as a single take. Mm. Following Lorne through 30 Rockefeller Center or 30 Rockefeller Plaza, excuse me, uh, for 90 minutes. That's not really feasible for a movie like this, but... Yeah. Mm, uh, there's so much going on that okay let, let me let me stop you right there I, I got i got one more sentence to finish the thought okay. <laughs> there's so much going on here that they manage not to overdo anything and yet everything is wrapped up yeah that's true that's true uh what i was gonna say was uh if sam mendez can do it with 1917 and basically make it one you know there were obviously a few actual cuts and everything and the hidden cuts in 1917 are so well done it's like i'm amazing. calling it i'm calling it one because it looks so good oh my god anyways if you can Time do it with a war movie like that you can do it with you, you could have done it with uh or someone could have done it with um saturday like it could have been done like that would have been cool yeah because I mean, you, it feels like it in certain points too, right? When you're, when the camera's following people down the halls, even though there are, you know, it's not like they're trying to disguise a cut or whatever. But even though it does cut back and forth, like it feels fluid. It feels like it, the tension and the the frenetic nature of everything that's going on behind the scenes is still there, and it's it's so immersive in that way where it feels like it's just you know, mind numbing and head pounding and like you can feel that.
even though it's not. Yeah. Um, two of my favorite examples of, of long take sequences other than 1917, which is a feature film made to look as though it's one take. Um, Spectre the, opening scene. huh? Spectre opening scene. We don't talk about, Spe we, we talked about Spectre three years ago for no time to die. It was, it was a great opening scene and the rest of the movie was mid. That was actually one take though. That was cool. But that was It cool. was. Yeah. Um, no, the uh, the basement kitchen walk in Goodfellas, Mm. um, which is, I mean, we talked about that in, in film school. Uh, my first few weeks, my first year, it's just, it's iconic. You're introduced to so many characters. It looks really, really good. You're just following those two characters, winding through hallways, winding through sets, one take, and it looks freaking fracking great. Um, and then one of my favorite TV episodes of all time, Charlie work. And it's always sunny in Philadelphia, the entire second block of that show or of that episode is, uh, is all one take. And that's the, uh, the scheme playing out in that moment. And, uh, it just, it, it's following so many different through lines, so many different storylines. all at the same time and yet the cameras all it never cuts the cameras following these characters the entire time so to see something like that maybe in the beginning of this movie when we're first introduced to gabriel labelle as lorne going through the hallways on the eighth floor of 30 rock and just based on looks not even not even a, a name drop of oh hey gilda When we see the big hair or uh, you know, Chevy falling down or something, like we, we just know who these people are Mm -hmm. because we have the context of knowing what the show was 49 years ago, uh, but we're also being introduced to this world in the movie. Yeah. So Mm that, that's, that's one Mm way I think -hmm. it could Even the, the part on the on the costumes and stuff too, right? yeah. Like that Um, kept flow going because it was just another way to drop in a few more people, a few more names, even if we hadn't seen them at that point. I mean, it's wonderful, right? yeah, and just what a list of names. Obviously, Yeah. this movie wouldn't be what it is if Saturday Night Live weren't what it is. And Saturday Night Live wouldn't be what it is if it weren't for that original cast and for Lorne. And so this movie's success as a project is kind of cyclical in nature for that reason. Uh, but I mean, we can just, we can go all night gushing about the names that we've already been talking about for the last 20 minutes. Chevy and Gilda and Lorraine and Jane Curtin And Aykroyd and Belushi and Lorne and Billy Crystal and Al Franken and blah, 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 blah. Matthew Reese is George Carlin. Fantastic casting. I, I mean, th this movie takes something that was brilliant 49 years ago and elevates it and dramatizes it in such a way that... If you're culturally illiterate and have never heard of Saturday Night Live, you can go into this film and experience TV history, a landmark night in the history of television, and get something out of it and appreciate what the history is with no context. That's how ridiculously well made this movie is. And it's, it's all the cred credit in the world. Some of the credit to Lauren and that cast and everyone who was actually there that night, but most of the credit, Jason Reitman, you know, doing movies like Juno and Thank You for Smoking and Ghostbusters Afterlife. Like this was Oh, yeah. a heavy product or heavy, heavy project to undertake. And obviously, knowing who his father is and what his father's legacy is with some of those. iconic comedies of the 80s
Ghostbusters, Stripes, uh, mm -hmm. Twins. Like, the Reitman family is synonymous with comedy. And for Jason to both pay tribute to his father and to the show, like he was one of the only guys who could do something like this with this movie. And he knocks it out of the park. Every decision that is made for this movie is the right one. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we said this was going to be sort of a shorter episode, so I think we've, we've gushed about it enough. Um, you know that the two of us really, really enjoyed it. I can guarantee it's going to be in my top five at the end of the year. I don't know where it's going to be in that top five, but Max, you can you can get a preview now, a sneak peek now that it will be mentioned <laughs> at the end of December for me. There you go. And it's got Ben's endorsement too. And for Ben to endorse a comedy is a rare occasion on this on this podcast. That's true. He would probably challenge that, but he's not here. So I will just tip my NBC cap to you, Ben, and wish you feeling better. Yep. Because uh, I'm sure you would have added a lot to this this <laughs> conversation tonight. Because who doesn't want to talk about SNL for half an hour on Zoom on a Wednesday night? Fair enough. So we had a great show for you tonight. Max is here, so stick around. We'll be back next week with We Live in Time. Prepare to have your hearts broken because that movie is going to be devastating. Yeah. In the meantime, Saturday night is playing in movie theaters. You can watch SNL on Peacock. Enjoy some good comedy. This is This is one of them. We'll see you next week. Have a good night. See you.